أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله إن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار اللهم أجلنا من النار وادخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار Oh Allah protect us from the hellfire Ya Allah free us from the hellfire free our neck our parents our children our spouses our offspring uh, the Muslimin, the one we love them for the sake of you, Ya Allah, free us all from the hellfire. Ya Allah, bring, bring the victory to the oppressed people <clears throat> all the way from the east to the west, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, stop all the uh, calamity and the fitna going on in Palestine. Ya Allah, end in peace, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, end this massacre killing, Ya Rabbil Alameen, in peace, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Um, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, most of uh, our uh, warriors last uh, week, we made dua for them to come home safe. So this uh, team of uh, medical uh, who they were stuck last uh, week, subhanAllah, they stuck, I think, altogether eight days, more than the days they supposed to stay in Gaza. Alhamdulillah, they all came home and they're all back to uh, you know, regular normal days. I'm sure we will listen mm -hmm. to them and they will tell us a lot of stories because everybody says, including Dr. Haifa, I think she went a month ago. Uh, she's a public speaker. Um, she explained a lot, uh, you know, things she say you see is nothing. Uh, the reality is so different. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take it easy on them and end this uh, um, big problem, big problem in the Middle East. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his wisdom. Inshallah, this calamity and this killing will end soon. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We'll give victory to those people who are oppressed, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So at the same, same times, we are talking about the migration now uh, and the immigrant of uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his believers. Because uh, now, remember, it's the 13 year of Al-Da'wah, the uh, Revelation is 13 years, right? Now we have to uh, prepare ourselves for the next phase. So during the three years, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prepared very well himself, and he prepared it for all the Muslims in Mecca, um, a place and a refuge. And finally, alhamdulillah, it worked with the people of Yathrib, right? So we talked during two weeks about uh, step by step how he met the six young men. The oldest was 21 years old only. Think about it. Think about our 20, 21, 18 years old kids, what they do today. You know, sometimes we call them kids, even though they're men and women. Subhanallah. So he made this plan with them. Then the, the six became 12. Then the third year, 73 people came and they told him, we are preparing to come to uh, uh, Rasulullah, to come to the city of Yathrib. And we want all the believers to come and everything is, uh, they give uh, the pledge to Rasulullah Sallallahu that it's gonna be, this is a safe for them. And they're gonna protect Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi and the believers as way they protect their own wives and daughters and women and children. Subhanallah. With that, now let's see, right? We finish Al Aqab Al Kubra, uh, the pledge, uh, the greatest pledge, when, what happened in secretly. Now, people of Quraysh, they knew it. Remember, they captured one of them. They captured Asad bin Zurara, uh, one of the people of, uh, of uh, Medina who signed the agreement with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They brought him to Mecca, they beat him up till the death, till uh, Abi Sufyan and another two people uh, named uh, Uthman bin Mad'un. And he said, we do business to Medina. And when we go to Bilad al-Sham, to Syria, we pass this Medina. And the only one who protect our caravans from thief and, and uh, stealing is this man. This man, Asad, so how could you do that? If you kill him, we're in trouble. So they let him go, subhanAllah. Anyway, now, what is the plan of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Nobody have any idea about the plan of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa All this meeting in secret, only Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Uthman, and Ali knows. 
Assalamu alaikum. Look at this beautiful face also. Alaikum <laughs> salam. <laughs> yes. So imagine now, uh, this is all secret. It's not like when Rasulullah comes back home, he gathered the believers around him, tell him, don't worry about it. I got I got this one, I got this one. I'm planning this. I'm, no. Himself, he did not know how this moving to the city of Medina was safe with all these believers, men, women, children. He, he has no idea. And last week we talked about one individual family what happened with them when they tried to leave, right? Which is Abi Salama, was his beloved wife, Umm Salama, and their baby Salama. What happened when they start to move? You know, the family came, they said, hey, Abi Salama, okay, we understand you wants to go, you know, obey Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi and run away to the Yathrib, but we're not gonna let you have our daughter with you. And they fought over her and they fought over the baby and she cried one year and, uh, we know the story. Then finally, this man who is honorable, he's not Muslim yet, who is honorable, met her walking by herself five kilometers. That's going to take her 10 days minimum uh, if it's walking. And it's unsafe, right? He will offer her to ride his horse and he will walk behind her. And he, she reached a city of Medina. He leave his animal with her and he walk back home. And Uthman bin Mad'oon, we said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa honored him after the opening of Mecca, after 10 years, yet Uthman did not become Muslim. But in the opening of Mecca, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa came back and entered with 10,000 of believers, we said that the majority of people on Mecca now, if it's not everyone, accepted Islam. And Mad'oon, Uthman, he is the one who carried the key of the Kaaba, we said, right? And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent after him to bring the, open the door. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, he called, where's Uthman? Uthman, they don't find it. Somebody said his home. So when he goes home, he goes, give me the key. He goes, oh, I don't have the key. The key is with my mother. So he said, go get it from your mom. When he goes, he doesn't come back. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wait a few hours and he tell Umar ibn al-Khattab, go bring it. If he doesn't give you in peacefully, if you have to fight him, fight him. I mean, this is the opening of Mecca. No one, no one can go against Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam against 10,000 army. And this time they have the weapon and their, you know, the, the sword they have here to chop some heads. And just waiting for the command of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when Umar ibn al-Khattab go and knock the door and they know that that is Umar, <laughs> they get scared and they said, here's the key. So he said, no, you have to come, uh, Asman, and give it with your hand to the Prophet. So when he gave the key to the Prophet of the door of the Kaaba, Abi uh, al-Abbas, the uncle of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ya Rasulullah, it will be our honor if you transfer this key from there, Abi Shayba's family, which is they always have this key to us, Abi Hashim family, just give it to me, give it to me. Let me hold it the rest of my life and it, was, it will be in my family. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, let me remind Uthman one story. During the first early of da'wah, right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was humiliated around the Kaaba many times. So one day Uthman, because he has the key, it runs in their culture, in that tribe, they must have the key. Other tribe, they give zamzam to the hajjaj. The other tribe, they give food to the hajjaj. They divided the honorable job back then before Islam. And he comes, he opens the door, and who goes in? Umayyah bin Khalaf, uh, Al-Walid bin Mughira, all the criminals, the leaders of Mecca, right? Abi Sufyan, they all go inside the Kaaba. Now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's a prophet, he wants to go in, and Uthman stopped him, said, no, not you, you cannot go. So he closed the door on them to whatever they're gonna do, and then they come out. Because entering the house of Kaaba is such honor, SubhanAllah. Uh, this is before Islam, imagine. And it says that they had idols uh, inside the Kaaba. Very few people will go, till today, very few people will have the honor to go inside the Kaaba. So when that happened, uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he begged him, he said, I just want to go inside. Just let me go inside, you won't let him. You know what he told him that day? We forgot to mention this last week. He said, just wait, Uthman, a day gonna come and I guarantee that I will have the control of this door. I will have the key of this door. 
and I won't let you go in. You know what Uthman answered Muhammad that day, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He goes, if that day come, me being under the ground will be better and more honorable to be above the ground. May he meant over my dead body or I wish I did that day, right? Now the day come and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is in Mecca and they bring the key and Uthman bin Maz'un standing and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam remind him the day. He said, remember the day I told you, let me go inside past 13, 14, 15 years maybe. And you didn't let me. And I told you, I guarantee this da'wah was going to spread. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, so he, he was so sure about every step he made. You told me being under the ground and that day will be better than being above. Here you are above the ground. Now give me the key. He had the key, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now Al-Abbas, his uncle, begging him, give me the key, give me the key. I want to hold the key and I'm going to open the door. And after that, Ya Rasulullah transferred the honorable from him, their family to my family. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, but Uthman, we are people who return favors. We never neglect people who do favor to us, whether they're a believer or not. We never gonna forget the day you traveled with Ummi Salama, the mother of Salama, all the way to the city of Medina, honoring her, respecting her, give her her dignity, not a word from you, because Ummi Salama described later on how honorable he was. He used to throw the stone in front of the animal to tell her, I need to stop and I need to do bathroom or something, instead of calling her with name or anything. And this man was kafir. But the akhlaq, rise. His manner, his behavior, the way he treated the stranger woman is beyond imagination. She swear the whole 10 days, he did not talk to her a word. And he will throw the stone to tell her, be ready, we're gonna go. And when she ride the animal, then he will go and lead the animal all the way till he reached. He said, Ya Uthman, you treated this lady, such an honorable way, we're not gonna forget that for you. So I want the key to be back in your hand and in your family, family, and no one dare take the key away from your family unless that person is in justice. Till today, sister, if the king wants to go inside that Kaaba, that family has to come and open the door. SubhanAllah. And this is the wafa. This is how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will honor the people who honor him the way he honored his wife even after he had her death, Khadija radiallahu anha. Whenever he see her friends, they became old ladies in the city of Medina, he will stop, he will talk to them, he will visit them, and he will cry because he will remember Khadija radiallahu anha. And those are suhaibat. These are her friends back then when they were young. Subhanallah, ya Habibi, ya Rasulullah, ya Habib. Of course, Uthman back then, immediately he accept Islam and he become Muslim, Subhanallah. Subhanallah. So now, let's see what is the plan of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So after this Hajj is over, and after the 70 people went back with their group and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave them the advice, please be in secret till you reach Medina. And he assigned 12 people of them to be the one who's gonna be in charge, right? Taking care of the people of Medina, teaching them religion and spread the, the word and prepare them to, for the upcoming of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and al muhajirin They didn't invite Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family alone. They invited all the thousands, maybe hundreds. I don't know the number, how exactly how much. They all have to come. And do you think these people, when they come as refugees, they're going to bring their wealth with them? They're going to bring their furniture with them? Let's see. Now, today we're going to see Musab. Uh, not, not Musab. Musab is a Safir, the first Safir. Uh, Suhaib. Suhaib Rumi, we call him, right? Uh, the, uh, he was uh, who was actually uh, Suhaib, very 
well known Sahabi, radiallahu anhu, so we call him Suhaib Rumi. But his originally, his ancestors, his parents are Arab, Arabian. They lived in north of Bilad al Hijaz. But when the Roman attacked them, they kidnapped him as a young boy and they took him as a slave. So he became a slave in the land from young age of the Roman. But because he was a very good looking and he looked like a blonde boy so they wanted him to stay inside the the palace instead of those slaves would look after the animal so he learned the language and he learned uh, of course uh, the aesthetic uh, etiquette of the roman the emperor how they live so they, you know, they treated them nice too but they learn a lot but later on when he knew that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam appeared to be the prophet and the messenger in the city of medina he ran away from the slavery and he come to the to Mecca before Medina, he come to Mecca and then uh, everybody will call him Sa'luk. Sa'luk mean, we don't know who's your family, you were a slave, uh, you have nothing, you got no skills, you don't even speak Arabic good. So they called him Suhaib Ar-Rumi, the Roman. So, uh, but Suhaib was a smart boy. He, he, I mean, someone who grew up in, in a palace, like Musa alayhi salam, he grew up as a young boy in the palace of Pharaoh. So look all the talent and the skill he had in there. On. So the same this young man. So he, he had all this talent. So he learned the business very fast, and he became within says within the ten years of uh, uh, of being in Mecca, he became very very wealthy. So this story also when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam decided to allow the people to leave, he gathered together with them and he told them, now I have a plan for you. Uh, what is the plan, Ya Rasulullah? We're going to do hijrah. I found the city of Yathrib. It's a safe haven for all of us. We're all going to go. Oh, Ya Rasulullah, why you don't go first? So this way we know that you are in a safe hand. You go first, take your family. And he had no family, just Fatima left, right? Uh, Zainab uh, married and uh, Umm Kalthum married and Duqayya married, so Fatima with him. So, Ya Rasulullah, just go you first. He said, no, no. I want all the believers go ahead of me. I will be the last person or the last one to leave because he has to make sure that all the believers ahead of him, the Muslimin, reach the city of Medina before him. Habibi Rasulullah, which general and leader will do that if any country get hit by, you know, their enemy or their in, dan in dangerous? Who who lead first? Who will hide first? Who will be on the plane first? You think when I can answer? But here Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did the opposite. Now uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab he picked up himself because he told them, now you could start doing your hijrah the way you you think it's safe. Just be careful because when people of Quraysh are going to find out that you're leaving, now everybody knows the plan. Be careful. They might attack you. They might, uh, you know, look what happened with Umm Salama immediately. So they prepared themselves for that. So when Umar ibn al-Khattab decided to go, uh, more than uh, 20 family who, with their wives and children, and they have a lot of babies, and uh, they don't have any support. So he got them together with Umar. Why? Because people of Quraysh cannot mess with Omar, radiallahu anhu. So on their way, one of those people, um, forget his name, I think Akif, Abi Faraon Mecca, we said, <laughs> Abi Jahl come after me, he goes, come on, come on, come on. Akif, I believe his name. If I'm wrong, Ya Allah, just somebody. He, go, he got him, he said, listen, you're serious, can I leave Mecca? You're a single man, you only have your mom, and you know how much your mom loves you. You're gonna leave and leave your mother alone? His mother's not Muslim, she doesn't wanna leave. Do you know what your mother said? She swear in God, the goddess, Allah wal Uzza, she swear. She will never take a shower. She's gonna let her hair messy and the lice will eat her scalp. No shower, no cleaning, no brushing hair. She's not going to sit in a shade in Mecca. It's hot. It's 50 degrees <laughs> Celsius. is like 120 is nothing, right? 130, 140. I was there in August. It was 145 registered in, <laughs> in Mecca. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It was in August. This woman, she said, I am, Abijah is telling, your mom's not going to sit in a shade. She's going to sit in the sun. She's, gonna, she's not going to eat. She's not going to take a shower. Why? She's upset because we're leaving. 
But he goes, oh my God, my mother did that. Yes, your mom swear she's gonna do that if you decide to leave. And Umar ibn al-Khattab saw his face and, you know, mom is mom. He said, no, 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 don't listen to Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl is lying to you. Even if your mom said that, believe me, one day, two day, the third day, that heat is gonna kill her brain. She will go back under the shade. And when she sees the laces eating up her hair, she will take shower. Don't listen to your, to Abu Jahl. But he couldn't because he keep, uh, you know, he keep going and going and after him and telling him about his mom. He, they want anyone. The Quran described in Surah Al-Baqarah, the disbelievers wants you to come back to your forefather religion. The matter what you do it, they're not gonna be happy till you return back to them. And this is what they want. Allahu Akbar. So, he said, uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to go see my mother. I'm going to return to Mecca. So Umar ibn al-Khattab said, take my horse with you. Because every time you look at my horse, it will remind you about me and about al-Hijra. Remember, sisters, Hijra was prescribed now. Every believer must leave Mecca. It will take time, but they have to have the intention to leave Mecca unless they were ordered and commanded by Muhammad Sallallahu for some reason. So the man was worried so much about his mother. He took the animal, what Umar ibn Khattab gave it to him, and he put it in his house, and he used it the way he wants. But when he went back to his mom, mom did not do any of those horrible things where Abu Jahl told him about his mother. She never even had the intention. And she said, what are you talking about? You want to leave? You could leave. But he stayed with his mother for one year. Every time he des described later on, every time he looked at the horse he got from Umar ibn Khattab, he will remember Umar ibn Khattab and he has a reason to go and do the migration. The following year, he did, alhamdulillah. So he didn't die in Mecca because it was a lot of ayat says, if you die in Mecca, you were a believer and you have the ability to live unless there are shackles on your legs, right? The family tie you up. Then, yeah, like Umar Salama, the family tied her up. Later on, when they let her free, she, she came. Subhanallah. Okay. Now, um, who's going to think? Um, people start leaving. Let's come back to uh, uh, Suhaib Rumi. Suhaib Rumi, so when he stayed in Mecca all these years, he made a lot of wealth. He did a lot of wealth. He became super rich. So when he decided to travel, he set up 10 camel with all his wealth, gold, silver, coins, money, furniture, silk, uh, rugs, whatever you can think about a businessman because he's a businessman. Yani, when you say you have a set up of 10 camel loaded, like you have trucks today, if you have 10 trucks loaded, it's equal economically. So when he set up all this and he left Mecca toward Medina, people of Quraysh said, no, 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 we're not going to let you do that. They ran after him and they said, Suhaib, <clears throat> 10, 12 years ago, you came to us, Sa'luk. You are just slave, man. You have no skin, no nothing. We taught you how to do business. You became rich. You became Muslim. You follow Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You decided to go after Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and go to the city of Medina, you are free. But all this loaded camel belong to us. Or we will kill you. He told them, no, don't kill me. I gotta go, I gotta go. What does it take? What does it take for me to go? Oh, we needed all your wealth. Give up all your wealth. He goes, I will give up everything but except one camel. At least I don't have to walk. They said, no, we need the 10. Not only that, we need, if every gold or treasure you have more, you couldn't carry it at home, you have to tell us where, we have to find it, or they captured him as a hostage. And he told them, go to my house, dig the ground. There is gold containers. He buried. They went. They found it. They came back. Then it says he has a nice burda. Burda in Arabic is like, you know those shiuch 
They have the gilabiya, then they have the abaya. We call it abaya, like sometimes see-through, beautiful, you know, it's designed. That's burda. He has a beautiful burda made in Persia, says, specifically for him. They said, we need your burda. That's too expensive to go with you. And Suhaib said, Wallah, I only left with my one piece of gilabiya, nothing in his hand. So he went. And after he reached the city of Medina, and after Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam met him, he told him, "Rabi al Bayya, ya Abu Yahya." His nickname is Aba Yahya, the father of Yahya. That tijara, you did that business with Allah subhanahu wa taala. You gave up your wealth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa taala. This, who's the successor here? You, because Allah subhanahu wa taala gave you paradise. So stories like this, it tells you that leaving your house and leaving your land because people in that land don't want you to worship one god freely it was not as easy as what we think take your car ride and leave or anything like that you see now how horrible is moving the north of gaza to the south or to the middle and then the enemy go after them and kill them and bomb them and this and that subhanallah history repeats itself now we have to know how Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam planned his immigration or his migration. Let's say that, right? His hijrah. So at this time, everybody's leaving, but Abu Bakr al-Siddiq he doesn't know if he should just leave because he is so polite. Not only him, all the companions are so polite. They get the command for, from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to leave. They prepare and they leave. They're so polite, they do not come ask Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam questions or something, you know, they want. Now, Abi Bakr Siddiq, in his mind, he wants to be, how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam planning to leave? Possibly he's going to be alone. Possibly he's going to ask somebody else to go with him. I just want that person to be me. It's just hope and wish in the heart of Abi Bakr. But at the same time, he feels responsible to obey and listen to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the Prophet said, hey, every believer has to start leaving. Don't worry about me. Every believer has to leave be before me. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq got his luggage, <laughs> got his camel, and he started with his family to leave toward the city of uh, Medina. Then a traveler coming, entering Mecca, he said, Salaam Alaikum, hey. Abu Bakr, where are you going? He goes, you know, uh, the, the hijrah is prescribed on us. The Prophet وسلم, said, everybody has to leave. I figured, you know, I have to leave. I waited a few days, but I feel guilty because he always, he's the first one to obey Rasulullah He said, I felt bad, but I'm gonna leave. He goes, you leave sahibuka, you leave your best friend alone in Mecca. And you go, I don't expect that from you. You should go back and wait. What if Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi ask you, why you left alone, why you left by yourself and you didn't wait for me? It's better you go back and wait. And he listened, the stranger, and he came back his home and stayed for a few days. Now Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has a plan. Again, it's a secret. He knew that most of the believers left Mecca. He goes at the middle of the day, which is abnormal. People of Mecca, people of Arabia, that culture, noon, they call it Qailula. It's a time even the animal cannot go walk. The animals sit, the camel sit, the horse sit. Everything calm down. The midday is extremely hot. No one will leave the house. It's time to take a nap and till the sun, the heat goes down. At that time, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam leaves his house and he goes, he knocked the door of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, his house, he has his two daughters and he has his father and he has his wife, maybe their children. And he goes, who? Who possibly will knock the door at this time? He come open the door, he say, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ya Rasulullah, it gotta be so important for you to come at this type of the weather, to come visit. He goes, yeah. he goes, yeah, Abu Bakr, anybody in the house? He goes, yeah, my family is in. He goes, no, 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 no. Tell them to go out. Tell them to go out. I need to talk to you alone, you and me. 
He goes, no, Ya Rasulullah, I trust my family. You could say whatever you want to say in front of them. He goes, no, this is too deep secret. I don't want anyone to know what I'm going to tell you. He said, okay. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he go. I ask the family to go and leave. I guess they don't have mansions. Like, okay, let's go second floor. Nobody's going to hear you talking, right? <laughs> as rich as Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, right? So the, the, the family leave. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he tell him, I have a plan. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded me, Jibreel alayhi salam came, he said, you have to take Abu Bakr al-Siddiq as a friend with you, don't go alone. You and Abu Bakr have the permission to leave. And you can obviously leave tonight, make the plan to leave tonight. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he goes, I was so happy. He started crying, he started crying from happiness. How could you be happy to leave your home? To You, you don't even know where you're gonna go. I mean, you're excluded from this, you, you know, that type of joy. He forgot the whole horrific thinking you're leaving your town one way with no money, with no business, with nothing to place you don't know. But all his joy is he's going to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Habibi ya Rasulullah ya Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Sahib, Sahib Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. So I saw him, he said, obviously he goes, ya Rasulullah, I prepared two horses. One for me, one for you. I was waiting and hoping you will come ask me. Look how polite he is. He didn't go tell him, take me with you. Just me, just me. Don't worry about Amr, don't worry about Uthman, don't worry about Ali. Ali, I mean, I expected Ali to be, or Uthman, his son-in-law. No, he said, it's you, Ya Abu Bakr. Oh my God, I already prepared. He said, I've been well feeding this two horse. I already hired somebody who know a secret path the Arabian don't know to take us from Mecca to Medina. I hired them already and I told them, but they're all waiting for my fingertip. So when Ya Rasulullah, let me know. So he tell him, it could be this evening. So the prophet leave, then he comes back. He said, no, Abu Bakr, it's not this evening. It's gonna be tomorrow. He goes, why Ya Rasulullah, why are you gonna wait? Why are you gonna wait? He goes, I have to wait because the people of Quraysh, I have amanat. They give me their valuable item in my house because he is a trustworthy, the only one in the city of Mecca. He have them in his house. Ya Habibi, Ya Rasulullah, these people want to kill you. These people are throwing you out of your town. You worry about their trust. You're holding their trustees in your house. You worry you're going to return to them tonight. He goes, Al-Amana, Ya Abu Bakr, Al-Amana. This is trustworthy. I'm not going to treat them the way they treat me. I got to go back home. Maybe I will assign Ali, radiallahu anhu, right, to do that for me. But he has to know which item to which family. He comes home. He calls Ali, radiallahu anhu. At this time now, Ali is 21 years old. When Ali, radiallahu anhu, the first one, who gave the pledge to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gathered his entire, maybe more than 100 plus members of Bani Hashim, including his uncles and their wives and their children and their sons, all together. It's a big family. Ali radiallahu anhu, the only one who got up when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told them, I am a messenger, Allah chose me, trust me, follow me, believe in me, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uprise you over this Arab. No one. Abi Jahl is on uncle. That day he got up and he cursed him. He said, what? Why God will choose you, not me? What's so special about you? You're a liar, right? But um, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu, he got up and he said, Ana I believe in you, Ya Rasulullah. You are the messenger of Allah. And he shook his hand at the age of 10. The uncles and the rest of the cousins, they made fun on him. He said, oh, you're doing a pledge with 10 years old boy. Let's see what he's going to do for you. Now, another 10, 11 years passed. Ali radiallahu an, take upon him to return all the amanat, all the trustees to their people. Not only that, look what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says. Ya Ali, Jibreel alayhi salam came and he told me, there's a plan in the Dar al-Nadwa, you know that, we call it the White House in Mecca, <laughs> where they meet the leaders, the criminals, and they plan what's going to happen. They got the plan, 
and they talked, but Jibreel alayhi salam told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam their plan in detail. What they got together, they said, they said, okay, all the Muslimin left. Some daughters of us left, some wife of us left, some son of us left. Who's, who's in the city now? We only have Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Muhammad, and maybe few family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa or few family of Abu Bakr. What are we going to do with the plan? The plan what? They came with a three solution. Whether we're going to jail Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, put heavy chain on him so he can't move, then uh, look, Al-Abbas is not with them. Because when they make daily plan, how dare they are, they cannot have anyone from Bani Hashim with them because they know Bani Hashim, even though they were not 100% Muslim, not even 10% was Muslim back then, they offered them Shi'ab Mecca and protected them. They left their rich town area and they came to this valley and they protected them for three long years, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And those people, Bani Hashim were not Muslim back then. Remember, Abi Talib was not Muslim. No, 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 no. If we do that, Bani Hashim is going to get very mad at us and it's going to be blood. They're not going to allow us to chain Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his house. Number one. Number two, okay, we're going to throw him, exile him to a different town, different area where we're going to put him on a horse and drive him somewhere and throw him there. They said, no, 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 no. The whole Arabian around us will make fun on of us and they will say one of their son, Arabian, abandoned him in the desert. That's not going to happen. What is the third solution? Oh, we're going to kill him. But who's going to kill him? If Bani Shayba kill him, then Bani Hashim is going to say, hey, one blood by blood. You cannot kill one of our son and we're going to kill you too. Who's going to kill him? Oh, this is where Iblis come in person and he sit with them and he gives them the idea. He said, listen, if you're going to kill him, it's not one man going to go kill him or two from two different tribes. No. You have to select your young men from every tribe and every corner of Mecca and participate in this action. The blood of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be destroyed distributed in the hand of this hundred corner of Mecca. So people of Quraysh cannot do anything. They cannot do anything. They cannot just finish Mecca completely and leave them alone to live at the end of the day, right? That would be impossible. They said, that is a genius idea. Let's do that. Let's do it. Tonight will be the last night for Muhammad maybe to stay. We're not going to wait. We're going to go and kill him. Who got the news in detail? Jibreel alayhi salam. Allah knows and the angels. Jibreel alayhi salam come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam and he tell him this is the plan. Think about prophets, how their enemy plan the same way. Think about Isa alayhi salam, how the enemy of him, the children of Israel who disbelieved in him and the Roman plan to come and crucify Isa alayhi salam that night. Same with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the story of this, the messenger of Rasulullah, or the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have such a similarity in their stories. Similarity in their suffering. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, they can have plan, they can have a hundred men come and surround my house. How am I gonna, how I'm gonna leave my house safe? You know what he asked? Ali radiallahu anhu, the 10 years old boy, who ha ha ha, you made a, you made a covenant with him. Who, let's see what he's gonna do for you. He asked him, Ya Ali, I'm gonna ask you something. Whether you accept or you don't, let me know. If you're not comfortable with this idea, let me know. How about you stay in my bed? You take my place. You wear my burda, again, my abaya, put it on you, sleep in my bed, in my house. After you return all these items to their people tonight, go back and sleep, and I will be with you. Then, at the middle of the night, when all these hundred men surround the house, I will leave. I don't know how, but I know I'm going to leave safe, and they're going to come attack you to kill you. Would you accept that? 
Of course, Ali radiallahu anh said, Fidaka ummi wa abi, ya Rasulallah. I sacrificed my, I mean, when, if the Arabian says, I sacrificed my parents for you, it's more heavy than saying, I sacrificed myself to you. Because the individual supposed to uh, love your parents and sacrifice for your parents. Now he's going to put his parents to sacrifice for the sake of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. wa abi, ya Rasulullah. Of course, I will do it. If I'm dead, I'm dead. I will do it. He said, go ahead. And the night come, and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq waiting in the middle of the night when Rasulullah sallallahu reached his house. He, he cannot come out. So the plan of Quraysh, uh, uh, the plan of uh, people of uh, Quraysh is well done. They call a hundred strong men. They have a hundred swords together collectively. They supposed to attack Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when they know that he is sleeping, deep sleeping now, middle of night, whatever. And that's when they're gonna open the door and go attack him and kill him. This way the blood of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is distributed. While they were doing that, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he got up, he's standing next to Ali. He put Ali in his bed, he covered them. He said, just keep having, make sure that you cover your face with my burda. So when they see you, they know, that's me. That's Muhammad, that's his abaya. Everybody know his abaya, his burda, right? He said, okay, I'm so long, I'll do it. While he's there, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he looked from the thuqub, he looked from the hole, and he sees as far as he can see around his house, all men standing, eyes open, ready with your sword. I guess Jibreel tell him what to do. Jibreel alayhi salam tell him, take handful of turab, open the door, take handful of dirt, and one of the narrated says, throw it in the air, and that will make them blind. But you have to do something, Ya Rasulullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can blind them easily, but just like when Maryam, peace be upon her, right? When she was asked why she's gonna give delivered to the baby Isa, what did the angel told her? Don't cry, don't be sad. Shake the palm tree, really? A woman giving a birth is gonna shake the palm tree? You can't even shake the pipe of the IV you have at that moment <laughs> in the hospital. Now you're gonna shake palm tree for the road up, for those dates to follow on you, yeah, well, you, no, you do, you, you do your, your part and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the palms fall of your uh, of you, Ya Maryam. Same here with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Pick up handful of dirt and throw it in the air. And that's exactly what he did. He opened the door, he took handful and he read, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ عَرْضِ اللَّهِ مِشْطَارَ جِيهِمْ From Surah Yaseen, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا فَأَخْشَيْنَاهُ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ We made like a sad, like, like a veil put it on their eyes, they can't even see you. So he threw that, he read that. He read this ayat from Surah Yasin, and he, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu walked. And when he walked, he went to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq's house at night. And now, let's come back, the story was Ali. Now, the men standing, it's almost the middle of the night is gone. A guy passing, he saw the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi walking. He saw him, he knew that's Muhammad. But he's just one of the people, the regular, ordinary people of Mecca. And he saw this man standing with a sword. And he talked to them. He said, hey, what are you doing here, everybody? Uh, they said, oh, yeah, you don't know our plan. Your plan is to kill Muhammad. Muhammad? I just saw him with my eyes a few minutes ago walking away. See, they said, no, it's not. We're standing here watching him. He said, I'm going to say, la hawla wa la quota illa billah. Are you crazy, guys? I saw him. I know what I saw. They said, okay, let's open the door and see. No, no, nobody passed from here. They grabbed the door of the room of Rasulullah and they opened the door and they saw this man sleeping and he has the garment on the top of his head. They said, that's it, that's it, that's it. And the minute they pulled the garment away from his head, they saw the face of Different between 53 years old man, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? And uh, what's his name? 21 years old, Ali radiallahu anhu. And who doesn't know Ali? And Ali got up because, ah, oh, where is Muhammad? He goes, Muhammad left. I'm here. Where did he go? I don't know. Not even Ali knows. He doesn't know. 
And of course, they go back to their club. They tell their, you know, the planners, look what happened. We failed. We failed you. I don't know how Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam slipped from our fingers, right? Just like that. They said, oh, where is he going to go? His best friend's house. Let's go to the house of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Now, people of Quraysh are crazy. They're so disappointed. They thought today, tonight is a night where they're going to see the dead body of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Habibi Rasulullah. They go knock the door of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr and Muhammad is gone. Who opened the door? Asma radiallahu anha, the oldest daughter of Abi Bakr al-Siddiq. And she was pregnant back then, it says. Abi Jahi comes, he said, where's your father? She goes, I don't know. Where is your father? Is your father with Muhammad? She goes, I have no idea, I don't know. It says he slammed her face, he made her bleed, and he knocked her down on the floor. But alhamdulillah, she didn't have miscarriage. And they go crazy. They come back to the meeting area, and they say, now what are we going to do? We just left, left Muhammad. We, we, we lost Muhammad, what are we going to do? How are we going to find him? What is the plan? They're sitting there. They said, the plan is we have to make a prize for the head of Muhammad, live or dead. 100 camel. Isn't that 100 men supposed to kill him? Now the prize is 100 camel. 100 camel? Like 100 Mercedes? Really? That's very expensive reward. Whoever come with the head of Rasulullah sallallahu or bring him alive, this is the price. Now, people of Mecca, outside of Mecca, they spread the news all over. It's just like wanted. You know how back then in Texas, they used to have this wanted. They put the picture and they put the prize. Right? Or oh, this cowboy will go out. They don't care. Who's this person? I don't know. But if I saw him, I have the picture. He must be in one club drinking. They'll get him and they get the prize. I mean, a lot of movies done like that, subhanAllah. This is now Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted life or dead. Now, all these young men who they don't care about what's the people of Quraysh fighting for, what's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam da'wah is about, Money, greedy, youth, young. Everybody said, we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And everybody's expectation, if Muhammad Sallallahu is going to Medina, Medina is the north, not the south. And Muhammad Sallallahu has his plan with Abu Bakr. And the plan, nobody know. Even Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, nobody, he doesn't know. Well, okay, Ya Rasulullah, you tell me what, what direction? This is direction. So let's come back to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're gonna spend three days and night in one area. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he goes south and instead of north. And all these people who are looking for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they all spread it. If it's not completely north, maybe east north, west north, north, nobody will think, <laughs> go to south. <laughs> You're not gonna, south is not gonna bring you to, to Medina, right? To Yathrib. So while that happening, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, we're going to go north and we're going to drive with these animals more than 10 kilometer. It's middle of night. 10 kilometer, then he saw mountain. He said, you see this mountain, Ya Abi Bakr? We have to climb this mountain. Ya Rasulullah, do you know how? Do you know there's a safe place there? He goes, no, yeah, Abu Bakr, but we're going to hide. We cannot continue. Right? We know that the people of Quraysh, you know, have this. Uh, they're looking for us. When the sun come out, they're going to catch us. We have to find a place. We're going to climb the mountain and sit there. So a lot of people went to Ghar Thawr. This is not Ghar Hara, where is the mountain uh, of the revelation and the cave called Ghar Hara. This is a different cave. And it's harder. It's more peak and it goes to the south. It's not from the sunnah or the tradition to go there, to see it. But a lot of young men who, you know, just curiosity, they go and, you know, one sheikh was saying that he really climbed that just to see how much effort he was 40, how much effort will take him. He swear it took him two and a half hour. And every time he'll climb, it was one like a road. It's the easiest to climb to that top of the mountain. 
It's all stone and stone and stone and stone. And don't even mention scorpion and snake and, and thorn and, and bushes and today monkeys also. They have mon a lot of monkeys around the mountain of Mecca. And the whole path from Mecca and Medina during the mountain, you see uh, monkeys. It's, it's different, different type of the monkeys than maybe in uh, the jungle because this is a desert, but I saw them because my last uh, trip of Umrah, we took bus and the bus driver will stop and we saw the monkey, how close they used to come to, especially if you go to Ta'if, uh, very close they come because they're hungry, they want to eat, subhanAllah. So they climbed this mountain and they found like a cave opening. So you go in, maybe two people fit, and in the back, there is also exit door, but the exit door is just opening. Maybe if you squeeze yourself as an individual, you can leave from that door. But the only opening, it's like a three stone. It's just made of three stone piled on top of each other. And you just walk in and you sit down. It's not like the people who come around you, if they look at you, they will see you. So they want to go there and rest. But before they enter, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq told him, Ya Rasulullah, hold on, don't go in yet. Let me go in first. Let me see if there is any snake, scorpion, maybe animal, maybe wild animal are, because you know, they're hiding. Maybe they're in the cave. I gotta make sure you're safe to Rasulullah. He goes in and he closed every hole he find it, whatever rags he has it with him. And he, then he tells Rasulullah Wasallam, come in, it's safe. And he goes in, he said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put his head in the lap of Rasul of Abu Bakr, and he go into deep sleeping. While he was there, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq's feet pushing, he saw a snake coming from one hole, he missed it. And he wants to protect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam from the snake, but at the same time, he doesn't want to disturb his safe and sound, his resting. He goes, I put my hand in the hole when I saw the snake peeking. When he put his hand on the snake, the snake bit him. The pain was unbearable. I want to scream, but at the same time, Abu Bakr said, I don't want to disturb Rasulullah I couldn't take the pain no more. I start crying. And the tears dropped to the cheek of Rasulullah and I wake him up. He goes, what's wrong here, Abu Bakr? You're crying. He goes, Ya Rasulullah, I am in pain. And the hand already swallow and red, the poison going. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told, he told him, I saw the snake and it bit me. He goes, he put his uh, water mouth on him. He spit on him and he touched him and the poison was kept out and his hand was healed. And then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he put his head one more time and he saw the face of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sweating, 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 becoming more heavy on his legs. And he knew that Jibreel alayhi salam is with him. Habibi, ya Abi Bakr, he experienced that. He said, I know Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam engaged with the message, messenger, Jibreel. When he finished, do you know what surah revealed on him? Right there? Anybody have any idea? Right there. They're in the cave. The first night, Surat Al-Qasas. Ya Habibi, ya Rasulullah, why Surat Al-Qasas? Qasas means stories. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to tell stories to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the beginning of Surah Al-Qasas, immediately the story of Musa alayhi salam. And he tell him the details, the story of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how in Ayah 7, Surah Al-Qasas, how very similar story. Musa alayhi salam, since he was a young boy, just before he was born even, he's supposed to be get killed, right? Because the Pharaoh has the authority to kill every baby born this year. And who's pregnant? The mother of Musa. Ya Habibi, Ya Rasulullah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we reveal, we send revelation to the mother of Musa that when the baby come, let him suckle your milk, let him take your milk. And if you feel scared that the army of Pharaoh gonna come and take that baby and kill him, make a coffin for him, put him in the coffin, and then, Okay, up to here, okay, okay, Allah, you told me, 
If I'm scared, I'm going to put my baby in the coffin. Okay, he's alive in my coffin and the coffin next to me, right? I'm going to peek on him. I'm going to sneak. I'm going to nurse him every time. But when the army comes, they're going to see a coffin. Coffin means there's dead body there. That's fine. She could do that much. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue telling her, if you scare that the army going to come into your house and they're going to see that coffin, pick up the coffin and throw it. Not put it slowly, slowly. Alqihi, alqihi bil Arabi. Hold it and throw it in the ocean, throw it in the sea. That's a, the that's a kind of the behavior the mother of uh, Musa السلام, was told in the story. But Allah to, subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the mother, wala takhafi, wala tahzani. Don't be scared. And don't feel sad. Why? 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 Ya, ya Allah, I'm going to throw my son in the coffin on the river and I'm not going to have a fear and, and scare and sad. Ya Allah, this is too much. Why? Allah promised. Inna he will return to you. And not only that, he will grow to become a messenger. That's Musa. And continue the, the story of Musa السلام, in the Surah. In the Surah, you read yourself, sisters. When he became a man, when he tried to kill, when he killed one of the Pharaoh, right? Trying to separate this Bani Israeli from the Pharaoh man, and the Pharaoh man get killed. One of the believers who's hiding her faith, right? He comes at night to Musa and he said, in the, uh, uh, the town planning, to execute you, Ya Musa, run away for your life. Isn't it Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi running away for his life that night? This is how Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed the ayat and the sewer just to come Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Trust me, trust me. As if Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, all the messengers went through the hardship. Musa Alaihi was kicked out. He left that night and he has nothing in his hand but a staff maybe a bag of bread. And he left this palace, Egypt, and to a, a, a desert. He has no idea where he's going. He has no plan. The same, Ya Muhammad. Maybe you have some plan in the city of Yathrib, but we don't know if you're going to reach it there safe or not. But trust. Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always. Allah will never put you down. So that the depression we go through, that sad, that crying, that awful moment we go through for nothing. If we have a trust and patience in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Exactly the story of Musa, he'll come. And the story of Surah Al-Qasas come on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when he is awake, he said, okay, now the sun is coming up. What is the plan, ya Abi Bakr? He said, don't worry, ya Rasulullah, I have a plan for you. I asked my shepherdman, his shepherd, remember Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, a businessman, he has a flock of sheep, and he has a slave man named Amir bin Fahira. He was his slave. He freed him after Islam. He taught him how to be Muslim. He kept his Islam secret because he's taking the business of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And he told him, Amir, early morning, come out with your sheep. We're going to be on this mountain up but we don't know how long. But when you see us in the morning, follow your eyes where we go. That's where you're gonna find us. And when you come, come with the milk so we can have breakfast. No cereal, <laughs> come with the milk. Only Amr now his eyes was, while he's shepherding around this mountain, he keep his eyes when Abu Bakr al-Siddiq come and he tell him, bring the milk. So Amir bin Fahira will bring the milk very early in the morning to give it to them. And then when the night fall, he tell before you take the sheep home, when the city of Mecca almost going to rest and sleep, the night fall in, wait late, and bring another container of milk for the Prophet and for me to have it. And you tell us, you're the spy and the eyes of, for us, Tell us what's people of Christ planning. Okay, collect the information. Now, Amr is secret. He doesn't tell anybody. The other person who know the secret where Abu Bakr and Muhammad وسلم, went to that mountain is the oldest son of uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Why? Because he told him, you have to come and tell us day by day what is the plan of people of Quraysh. 
where they're up to. <clears throat> okay? That's the only one. Asma, that daughter who got slammed by Abi Jahl, when the day, the moment her husband, her father, and the Prophet وسلم, were leaving, she prepared with her scarf. She cut it into two halves. She put a lot of food on both, and she asked them to tie on their waist with their food, at least for that day. That's why we call her that nitaqin. You know, she's not the one who will climb the mountain and bring the food. Like they told us these kind of stories when I, I remember in elementary books, maybe they called her that in and that's her nickname, that she has two ties. One tie she tie on her belly because she was pregnant. And in the morning she will go up to bring the food to her father and Abi Bakr. But no, no, that neither Abi Bakr will allow his daughter to do that. Because it's just like they're searching for Abu Bakr and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, in a town, everybody's searching for your father. You're not, not going to put your daughter in a dangerous, but his son, Abdullah, can do that. So, by the way, he was not Muslim yet. Then, Amr bin Bahir doing the same. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he said, when the night milk arrived to me, he goes, I did not drink from it. I took a sip just to stop my hunger, because his son will bring food the next day. He will keep most milk for the prophet when he wake up in the middle of night and he says, do we still have some milk? He said, yes, ya Rasulullah. I will see the prophet. This is a very long hadith and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq telling us. This is the prophet. He will hold the container and he will drink and drink and drink till you know what Abu Bakr said? He feel like as long as the prophet was drinking, he feel Abu Bakr himself that ah, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is full. That's the love of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. No one will do that. No one. يؤثرون على أنفسهم ولو كان بهم خصاصة. Even though he's hungry, he's tired, he offer. This to the messenger above himself. Selfish? No. No. So now Amir bin Fahira, when sometimes Abu Bakr al Siddiq will come down, when he's going back up, you know, he will ask Amr to just hide the footsteps because in the sand, when you walk, there's footsteps. Hide, scribble the sand. So Amir bin Fahira did a lot of favor for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr. Three days and night, bring milk to them, bring some news if he can, and then he hides the footsteps of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not leave the cave unless he had to go to the bathroom. He did not come down to the up and down as Abi Bakr did, because Abi Bakr's eyes was just up and sometimes and down, or he would reach his son halfway to bring the food. Now let's hold on on Amr bin Fahira. We're not gonna hear his name ever again in the Sira. The only time you hear his name in the Sira is one of the uh, Syria, they call it. It's not a real battle, a war engaged between the enemy and the army of Rasulullah in the city of Medina, because later on he come to the city of Medina, right? And he's a good believer. But one of the small group of people who they go out and they check if there is enemy of, of, of the believers coming around, they check and they spy and they come back, bring the news, he was there. Then they were attacked by the enemy of the Muslimin and he got killed. Then it says Al-Abbas, he was there, one Sahabi, and he goes, I looked around, I said, Abbas is, uh, Amr is missing. Where is Amr bin Fahira? Where is Amr bin Fahira? Everybody said, he must be get, get killed. He must be, get, okay, where is his dead body? We don't see him. They're looking, they're looking, they're looking. Then he said he saw a cloud going up and this cloud, it's so moist and the look, all of them they saw that the angels holding this dead body elevating to the heaven and this dead body was washed with the water and the water was dripping. This is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored the dead body of Amr bin Fahira because what he did to protect for three days and bring milk for Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and Muhammad 
صلى الله عليه يا رسول الله how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward his servant in this dunya before akhirah so now the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم three days night done and Abdullah his son bring him the news the people of uh, Quraysh almost give up so every time when people go out they can't find any any spa or any sign of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم they come back losers and every time they have plan you know you get the news now uh, Abu Bakr and Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم said Jibreel عليه السلام gave them the permission to leave the mountain and go now from south you gotta go all the way to Jeddah may Allah reward the uh, sister uh, Debbie she brought me a nice beautiful uh, gift a book with the plan on the map one of the scholar it took him 20 years to make that book step by step he had evidence of the the road path Rasulullah Abu Bakr took from Mecca all the way to Medina. It's a big book in color, beautiful. I'll send you the picture and the name of the book if anybody wants to buy it. May Allah reward you, Dabi. So, uh, so he said, we went towards Al Bahar Al Mayyat, the Dead Sea, and that's all the way going to the west. But Abu Bakr Siddiq has no clue this past. He hired a disbeliever man. His name Abdullah bin Arqat or Uraiqat. Uh, uh, that's his name. Abdullah bin Uraiqat, right? He hired him. He has his horse and he knows a path. He paid him and it's trustworthy. Yes. And that tells you that sometimes you as a believer, you could trust the disbelievers. If you know they're trustworthy, it's okay to hire them to be your leader or your guard, leading to you to some, some information. It's not leader to follow them as a lead. So uh, Abdullah is going to lead them all the way to Medina, but a very, very unknown, a different path. People of Christ never used it before. So during that time, uh, it says they have now three uh, horse, and three like many things gonna happen. I think it's one hour past, and I wanna take you, and I'm making this the story more excitement, inshallah. I hope so. So to just reside in our uh, heart and to become loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his best khalifa, the first khalifa Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, we forgot to mention the ayah in Surah at Tawbah revealed that when uh, um, when they were in the mountain the, the third day, just before they lived in, in uh, Ghar Thawr, uh, the people of Quraysh actually, they said this is the last spot, we didn't see it. They came up with the mount with their horse, not walking. They came up with the horse. And uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was so scared because he's hearing the footsteps of the animal. But the people riding on the top of the horse, if they do do duck their head down, they will see the feet of Abu Bakr and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's when he, Abu Bakr was so scared for the life of the Prophet. That's when the ayat came, مَا بَالُكَ بِثْنَيْنْ وَاللَّهُ ثَالِثُهُمَا What do you worry about two people here? Yeah, Abu Bakr, calm down. Allah is us. And the ayat revealed in Surah Tawbah how him and Sahib, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala called Sa'idhuma fil الْغَارِ uh, so they were in the cave and him and his friend. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put an army, invisible army, in the eyes of those disbelievers who they came to kill and, you know, uh, execute Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but they couldn't see it because there is invisible army of the army of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people, they say, maybe the pigeon made uh, a nest and a, spy, a spider came and made the web. So they said, oh, it's impossible anybody will be in that cave. Look at the pigeon. Uh, you know, if you read a poem, there's a poem says, neither the pigeon, neither the spider web uh, could, uh, you know, seal or protect Muhammad Wasallam, but the invisible army. Uh, and in the Quran stated that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put on the army, could be an angel, could be veil. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the veils on their eyes of those people. Even Abu Bakr al-Siddiq says one of those enemy came from the back where if you look, you will see them straight to your face and the man's head was toward that hole because he came there to do his business. He wants to relieve, uh, right? But if you turn his face and he will look, he will see Abu Bakr al-Siddiq from the other opening, subhanAllah, yet they couldn't see.
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now we're going to continue the journey next week, inshallah ta'ala. And this journey, it's become uh, very uh, interesting and very excitement. And this is the safety of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we're talking about. Why someone, I ask, I ask myself, why Al-Buraq didn't come? Why the horse of Al-Buraq didn't come and say, hey, Ya Muhammad, the way we took you, elevate you to Al-Aqsa Masjid and we took you overnight. You had this long journey, right? That was like three years ago. Why didn't it come right now? And just Abu Bakr, yeah, it would fit, this Buraq. Abu Bakr and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Your journey to Medina? No. Look how Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala he test also his prophets and messengers. They go through very hardship. It's not easy to be a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in danger all the time. And he did not know if he's going to be safe or not. The only time he knew it that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu ya'asinuka min al-nas. Khalas, people cannot execute you, ya Rasulullah. You're protected. Yes, you're going to go through the fear, the scare, the hardship, but as much as Abu Bakr Siddiq was so worried about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was worry-free. Why? He put all his trust in Allah. Like, I don't know if the mother of Musa could do that. No, the mother of Musa says she was going to scream that day when she put her baby in the basket, in the water, and she was going to scream, says, oh, that's my son, please, I want my baby back, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we made her heart a little bit stronger. We hold it on you, mother of Musa, till all the ladies in, in the city of, of, of uh, Egypt came and to try to feed this baby because the baby crying, it's, a, it's in the palace. They don't have a formula. They want a lady who have a baby, she, she can come and nurse this baby and Musa what a beautiful story we forbid for Musa baby Musa to accept any breast no any breast he put on his way even the milk squeezing to his mouth he will cry and he will refuse to suck up till his own mother come when the own mother come she just want to say oh that's my baby but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said keep it secret don't say it and when they ask her, oh my God, how come your baby is accepted by this baby? Your milk is accepted by this baby. They could, that could be your mother. You could be the real mother. She goes, no, I'm not. Then Musa's sister speak. No, she said, I told you, my mom's milk is so good. that There is not one baby in this town will refuse her milk. It's so good and so delicious. And her chest is so gentle. Sadruha. Her chest is so gentle. Any baby will just hug her and accept her. This is how she tricked them. And indeed, she was a real mom. And when they told her, okay, come and stay with us till this baby came, she goes, no, I'm not going to come and stay and feed your baby. I don't know whose baby is that. You need me, you bring the baby to me. I have a husband. I have daughter, as you see her. I have other kids. Harun was there. I have other kids to look after. I cannot just sit in your palace and leave my family for your baby. They made her a palace inside the palace. And they told her, bring the entire family. Let them live here. You look after them. You take care of them. When baby Musa cry, he will come to you, drink the milk, and go back and play. And that's how the family of Musa salam, was there. Till Musa salam, became two years old. So he can eat now. Habibi ya Rasulullah. So stories of the Quran are so similar, so similar. And what we see today about the crisis of the believers is so similar, it's so touching. Like if we go through any pain, remember all the pain, the suffering of Rasulullah and his companions went through. Look at Su Suhaib. I mean, all his wealth is just gone overnight. And he just ran away for his just one piece of garment to Mecca, to Medina, from Mecca to Medina. Those are the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam who they loved Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so much. Inshallah, next week we'll continue. Jazakumullah khairan. I went a little bit over an hour. I always promise. 
I'm not going to take more than an hour, but I couldn't. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me. Any mistake, it's my mistake. And anything was true is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring happiness, serenity, peaceful in your house. Remember, every time Muhammad is mentioned, just say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the peace and serenity and the blessing come to you 10 times more directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jazakumullahu khairan.